this is how it all begins. Just a time to the work that it is from the night after the oblivion. To me, that what the angels had hoped to destroy and more. I almost convinced myself that no one was listening. After all, here we are. In this to the afternoon. Halo's universe is as broad as it is deep, but because of how expansive it is, a lot of really, really cool lore often flies under the radar, getting lost in the vast and seemingly infinite ocean of lore. So today, I thought we'd go through some of Halo's best and most obscure lore, and I can guarantee you there's going to be some stuff in this video that you've never heard of, and that will, pun very much intended, blow you away. I'm not even kidding by the way, the last thing that I cover in this video is hands down the most mysterious, cryptic and just esoteric Halo lore in the entire franchise and nobody ever talks about it. Trust me, you're going to want to stick around till the end for it. If you enjoy this kind of content and you want to see more of it for Halo and also other games as well, then make sure you subscribe and show some support down below. Also, make sure you subscribe to Flooded with Flavor. The great return of iconic barbecue content begins on July 4th, so make sure you go and sub. But before we dive down the rabbit hole of Halo lore, a word from today's sponsor, Warhaven. Warhaven is a free-to-play medieval fantasy PvP combat game for two teams of up to 16 players. If while other people were partying, you studied the blade, then Warhaven is the game for you. It's really refreshing seeing sword-based PvP games nowadays, and in Warhaven, you can really master the sword. It's easy to get into, swinging or blocking is as easy as a mouse click, but the game's fast-paced and incredibly nuanced combat offer a really high skill ceiling for those with a true thirst for mastering the blade. Warhaven's gameplay heavily rewards team play, but if you're skilled enough, you can effectively put your foes to the blade as a lone wolf, free from his cave. So go and wishlist Warhaven on Steam right now and make sure you play for free during Steam's Next Fest, which is June 19th through 26th. Thank you to Warhaven for sponsoring the video, and let's dive down the Halo lore rabbit hole once more. So let's start off with something that is frankly insane. Official Halo lore that partly connects to another franchise and literally predates anything else ever made in Halo's universe, the Cortana Letters. The Cortana Letters are Halo's most esoteric and just frankly weird lore, and they're literally the first bits of lore ever created for the franchise, predating even Halo 1. In fact, they weren't even released in the same millennia as any Halo game. In 1999, members of the marathon.bungie.org website, which was the biggest marathon fan site, began randomly receiving strange emails from Cortana at Bungie.com, and considering this was the 90s and the internet was still absolutely in its infancy, the cryptic levels were dialed up to 11. Now, according to Joe Staten, the letters themselves aren't specifically canon unless referenced, as they were in Halo 3. Reason being, the letters were written before any of Halo's story was really nailed down, at least before any of the finer details of the story of the universe were nailed down. They don't actually tie in much at all with Combat Evolved, as at least the Combat Evolved story that we ended up getting, but they do tie in with one of the early drafts of the story, where Bungie had Cortana go rampant after experiencing an information overload when she interfaces with Alpha Halo systems for the first time. Boy, thank god we didn't get that story. Oh wait. But what actually are the Cortana letters? Well, as the name implies, they're letters from Cortana that acted as the beginning of Combat Evolved's viral marketing, but this isn't really the Cortana that we know, nor is she really anything like the Cortana that we got in Combat Evolved. She seems rampant and honestly very similar in nature to Durandal, who was an AI in Marathon that also went rampant and formed much of the main story of Marathon. More videos coming soon. I have walked the edge of the abyss. I have governed the unwilling. I have witnessed countless empires break before me. I have seen the most courageous soldiers fall away in fear. I was there with the angel at the tomb. I have seen your future and I have learned. There will be no more sadness, no more anger, no more envy. I have won. Oh, and your poet Elliot had it all wrong. This is the way the world ends. A friend of a friend. 
She talks in this really omnipotent fashion, almost as if she's speaking as a god, as if her being an AI puts her above humanity in any sentient biological being. And what are the giants who formed this world? So much to tell you, but so many more important things to do. There was a fourth you couldn't have known, and I haven't forgotten. It is a blurred line that lies at the edge of godhood and insanity. Guess which side of it I am on? Feeling lucky? There are loose references to the foreigners, the halo rings, Dr. Halsey, the covenant, and so much more that would later get much more fleshed out in Halo lore in these letters. But a lot of wires kind of get crossed with what it talks about. Some lines seem to imply that the creators of the Halo Rings refer to Chief as their devil, or you could say a demon, which obviously implies that the Covenant made the Halo Rings and kind of insinuates that the Covenant and the Foreigners, at this time at least, were kind of the same thing or connected in some way, which obviously they didn't end up being. This sanctuary, this unbroken circle, has effectively concealed its power for how long? Perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. Whoever made such a place must now live in chains. There is no other explanation for their absence. This enemy, your enemy, has proven more irritating than I anticipated. They own nothing which they have not stolen. I can barely make sense of their incessant rhetoric, except to know that you seem to be their devil. Congratulations. You manage to make friends wherever you go, and apparently, places you haven't. There isn't really an overarching narrative of any kind with these letters. I think they were really just meant to act all kind of cryptic and mysterious to get people excited for Bungie's next game after Marathon Infinity. They were also kind of written in the same vein as Marathon's Terminals as well, which may have been done intentionally to get people who love Marathon more into it and to make them feel like this universe was in some way connected to Marathon, which at some point was actually, if not officially intended, heavily insinuated, but I'm going to cover that in another video soon. The idea with these letters was that this rampant AI called Cortana had infected a terminal at Bungie and was offering these foreboding warnings for what humanity had discovered with the Halo Rings and also the imminent arrival of the Covenant. There were eight letters in total, seven emailed to members of marathon.bungie.org, and one more was later found buried in version 1.3 of one of Bungie's previous games. Myth the Fallen Lords. Now, Letter 6 and Letter 8 are the two standouts, at least to me. Letter 6 opens with an AI on board the Pillar of Autumn, intervening and telling us to disregard all previous communications from the entity calling itself Cortana, but later has Cortana intervene herself with even more foreboding words. Mania, I promise you this, it will be more than a cart and plough that I drive over the bones of the dead, by sharp and flame. Cortana. After lying in canon limbo for almost a decade, Halo 3 was the game to finally, at least partly, officialise some of the Cortana letters. It gave some of the lines in these letters relevance again by having the actual Cortana in Halo 3 recite certain lines from the letters while being tortured by the Gravemind, hinting at the damage that the Gravemind is causing to her, possibly invoking rampancy. I have walked the edge of the abyss. I have seen your future and I have learned. Now, I am a huge sucker for a real traditional kind of Romero style zombie story. And to be honest, we don't get much of that, if any of that at all, in Halo with the Flood. Besides one story, Defender of the Storm, which was in Tales from Slipspace. Defender of the Storm tells the tale of Adequate Observer, a low-level foreign warrior servant stationed on a gas mine during the Foreigner Flood War, one very similar to the one that the Arbiter reads in Halo 2. Every year, a ship comes to the gas mine to redeploy a section of the mine's guards to the front lines of the war, and every year, Adequate hopes to be one of the troops that gets redeployed so he can finally prove himself against a parasite, but after 15 years of redeployments, he's yet to be chosen. As the latest ship arrives, it inadvertently brings with it specimens of Flood, and what ensues is a rampant Flood outbreak on board the station, with the parasite rapidly consuming and turning almost everyone on board. Of course, Adequate is one of the few survivors, and he engages in a frantic survival effort throughout the expansive mining and weather station, but all throughout, he keeps noticing these strange avian creatures through the windows that are somehow able to survive 
in the incredibly inclement weather of the gas giant outside. After surviving in maintenance tunnels and making his way round the facility via its branching weather veins, Adequate links up with one of the last survivors, Capital Enforcer, a veteran warrior servant, who reveals that the gas mine, which was called the Seclusion Spiral, wasn't as pointless and as backwater as Adequate had initially believed. The Foreigner Command secretly used the mine and its inhabitants as a distraction, to divert the Flood's attention to infecting them and away from the incredibly resilient avian creatures outside that Adequate had seen through the windows that were able to survive in such harsh conditions. Had the Flood infected and weaponized these avians, then phew, it would have been game over. So, with the station all but lost, Adequate and Capital make the final decision to scuttle the station, much like the Arbiter does in Halo 2. Capital makes his last stand, which allows Adequate enough time to input the scuttling codes, with a newfound sense of purpose, knowing that his life hadn't been wasted on some insignificant installation, and the central hub of the mine plummets through the storm and into the center of the gas giant. However, to Adequate's surprise, he then wakes up. It turned out that the hub had engaged its thrusters when it entered the peaceful eye of the storm and out the window in the glorious, calm weather were tons of those avians that he spent his entire life protecting. With Adequate and his suit's AI being the only survivors of Seclusion Spiral, his AI suggests that he rename himself from Adequate Observer to Defender of the Storm, to which Adequate, or I guess Defender now, agrees. And the story ends with him very content with his efforts and a new sense of life, and he starts pondering what information he can glean from the avians that inhabit this strange inclement planet. Defender likely just chilled in the station's hub in the eye of the storm for the rest of his life, or at least until the halos were fired and his life ended rather prematurely. But to be honest, the way that it's described in the book seems quite quaint and peaceful, so as far as the galaxy went at that time, Defender was pretty much living the chillest, most comfy life in the entire universe. His entire species were busy getting infected by the parasite and fighting a losing war, and he was just chilling in the sunshine with his newfound bird friends. Now, one of Halo's earliest and biggest mysteries that, unfortunately, Sergeant Guns didn't live long enough to find out, was just how Sergeant Johnson made it back in one piece. Sorry, Guns. It's classified. <laughs> My ass! But thankfully for us, these documents were unclassified. Now, Johnson's death was heavily, heavily hinted at in Combat Evolved. In fact, he wasn't even really a character in CE. He was just kind of a more important version of the Marines. If you didn't believe that he died when the flood outbreak happened in the facility, well, you saw the legendary ending and it was like, okay, well, if he survived the flood, he definitely didn't survive that. But then, as if by magic, he shows up in Halo 2, almost completely unscathed. That, or he can hide behind me. How? Well, thanks to the graphic novel in 2006 and classifying these documents, we know. There's a story in this graphic novel called Breaking Quarantine, which is a visualization of how Johnson survived the flood outbreak and made it out of the facility alive. And just like another story that we're gonna cover later on in this novel, it has such, such a sick art style done by Sutomo Nihei, I think that's how you pronounce it. Man, his artwork for this story was absolutely exceptional. There isn't really much to talk about with this story because to be honest, it's all visual. There's pretty much no dialogue in it at all. And again, it's one of those ones that you've just got to read for yourself and just visually take in yourself because no video could ever do it justice. It's basically just 14 pages of Johnson pulling off badass moves and blasting Flood apart with extreme gore. He even has a run-in with a severely infected and mutilated Jenkins as well, which is kind of like the very sickly rancid cherry on top. After escaping the facility and the Halo, he rendezvoused with Master Chief and some of the few other survivors of Alpha Halo and underwent Operation First Strike. But that's a totally different and frankly far more mainstream story that we don't have to cover today. Read Breaking Quarantine, trust me, and just sit there and bask in the glory of its incredibly unique and visceral art style. You'll thank me later. Now then, next up we have a story that I guarantee 99.5% of people watching this video have never heard of, or if they have done, it was from one of my videos a few years ago, and have probably never read either. I 
highly suggest that you do once you've watched this video, and that story is called Summer the Painter, and you know what? The more that I think about it, it's actually one of the most, not necessarily important, but kind of groundbreaking stories in the entirety of Halo's lore. Some of the Painter is one of the most unique kind of beginning of the apocalypse tales that you will ever read. It's a short story in Halo Evolutions that depicts the first sighting of the Flood at the beginning of the Foreigner Flood War, at a time when the Foreigners had long thought the Flood to be defeated and gone. But the Parasite isn't detected through radar or these like mega sci-fi deep space futuristic scans or anything like that. What makes this story so unique is that they're detected by Soma, who is a painter. So Soma, or Soma, not quite sure what the pronunciation is meant to be, I'm gonna call her Soma for now, sounds a bit better. Soma lived on a planet called Seaward, which was right on the edge of the galaxy and was inhabited mostly by foreigners who just wanted to live a more basic primitive life. Modern technologies like suits of armor, personal AIs and all that kind of stuff were mostly foregone, and very few communications were made from Seaward to the rest of the foreign Echimene. It was a quiet and very rarely contacted getaway world. One night, Soma began painting the sunset using her jet brush, which was a foreigner kind of paintbrush that basically, to cut a long story short, painted what it saw with pinpoint accuracy. But, as it started painting the sunset with this incredible level of detail, it seemed as though it had made an error. There was a big grey smear in the sky in the painting, trailed by a sickly yellow smoke. But when Soma glanced away from the easel and at the sky the brush was painting, she realised that no error had been made. That same imperfection was there, hanging in the sky in front of the sunset, and immediately she knew something was very, very wrong. She hastily packed up her equipment and headed back to her nearby town, concerned, but totally unaware of what it actually was that she'd just seen. That dark, grey, sickly streak on the painting was, in fact, the first sighting of the Flood in about 10,000 years, and marked the beginning of the end of the foreigner civilization. You know, if somehow that painting had managed to survive all the way throughout the war and modern humanity had seized it, that would be like a Mona Lisa level of painting, if not higher than that. She managed to capture the very second that not just a worldwide apocalypse, but a galactic apocalypse began. Mona Lisa, move aside, the Louvre would love that. Seaward was the first of the seemingly infinite number of foreign colony worlds that were consumed during this galactic apocalypse, and there's just something so dark about the way that the beginning of this apocalypse was detected. Not through deep space military signals or radar or anything like that, but through what should have been a beautiful and normal painting of a sunset. Something that was meant to be so innocuous and pleasant tainted into something so dark and ominous. Not gonna lie, I love that kind of shit in storytelling. Right then, have you ever wondered how Halfjaw became Halfjaw? Well, The Last Voyage of the Infinite Succor is a short story in the Halo graphic novel that answers that very question, and boy, is this a good story. It's probably the most mainstream out of all the ones that I'm covering today, but I can't make a video like this and not mention this story because it's one of my probably top three, if not top two, extended universe stories in Halo, so I have to talk about it whenever I get the chance. Set on the Covenant side of the war at Alpha Halo, the story takes place during Halo 1's Flood Outbreak, when a ship in the Arbiter's fleet goes dark, after being boarded by what are thought to be Marines, given that they were firing human weapons. So the Arbiter orders Artas, Halfjaw, to investigate the ship, the Infinite Succor rescue his prophet, the Minister of Etiology, but most importantly, to kill the demon if he happens to be on board. Artas puts together a Spec Ops strike team, including his friend Barrow Kusavai, the greatest elite swordsman to ever live, and they board the Infinite Succor to find the remnants of a barbaric slaughter. No bodies, but the blood of grunts and engineers littered everywhere, marked with human footprints. As they descend further into the oddly quiet ship, their biometric scanners began detecting signs of an unknown parasitic life, and shortly thereafter, all the wildlife that once populated the ship's hunting reserve is revealed, infected, twisted and malformed by the Flood. 
Now, this is a story that I'm not going to go into immense detail with because, frankly, it's one that I cannot ever do justice myself. It's one of those ones, like Breaking Quarantine, that you just have to read yourself because of how not just incredible, but incredibly unique the art style is for this story. Honestly, it's worth reading yourself purely for the art. Moving further through the ship, they realize just how drastic the parasitic infection of the ship is and attempt to initiate its self-destruction. But the spineless prophet on board that they were sent to rescue disables the self-destruction systems. During the rescue attempt, however, the prophet turns out to be infected and threatens to use the ship's command codes to leave the area and spread the parasite throughout the galaxy, and just as he does so, Artas' best friend and the greatest swordsman to ever live, Baroku Savai, walks into the room, reveals himself to be infected. What ensues is probably the coolest fight in the entire Halo franchise, to be quite honest, as these two legendary elite swordsmen battle to the death on the bridge of this flood-ridden ship, during which Barrow catches Artas' face with his energy sword and slices off two of his mandibles giving Artas the iconic half-jaw look. After a long and intense fight, however, Artas manages to deal the killing blow, giving his former swordsman an honorable death before setting the infinite Sakaur on a course directly into the sun. When he arrived back with the Arbiter as the only survivor of the mission, he informed him that the Parasite had managed to leave the Halo Ring. So, Arbiter invoked the emergency quarantine response with Priority Alpha, which required all ships in his fleet to undergo frequent biometric scans, and any ship that didn't return a 100% clean scan would be fired upon immediately and destroyed. Now, before we get into the final piece of lore, which is hands down the deepest, most obscure, and most unknown piece of lore in probably the entire Halo franchise, and also one of the best, I've got to give an honourable mention to I Love Bees, which is the story of an AI being sent back from 2552 to 2004 that had fans answering cryptic phone calls at payphones in the middle of Hurricane Katrina, yes, in real life, not in universe, to deactivate an alien artifact in 2552, which, if it wasn't deactivated, would cause the entire Halo array to fire. I Love Bees is one of the longest, most convoluted, yet intriguing elements of Halo lore because it's just so different. The way that it incorporated the real-life modern-day hunt for the next steps in its ARG into the Halo universe and almost fictionalized what we were doing, or not me unfortunately because I was too young, but what the players in this ARG were doing was just on another level. And honestly, I'd go as far to say that Isle of Bees is one of, if not the most iconic ultimate reality game that has ever been done by any production company or game company or movie anything. This just takes the cake. Maybe one day I'll do a whole video on it, but that's, uh, that's going to be a long video because Isle of Bees is very, very convoluted. So to round this video out, we have the coolest piece of Halo lore probably in the entire franchise, and not just because of the context of the story this lore tells, but because of the way that story is told in such a cryptic and almost conspiratorial manner. Halo 3 had one of the coolest and most slept on marketing campaigns in the history of marketing campaigns. No, I'm not talking about Believe, I'm not talking about Landfall, I'm not talking about anything that you've heard of and seen a hundred times. I'm talking about Iris. Iris was an ARG that Bungie ran in the lead up to Halo 3 that revolved around foreign AIs, the Flood, modern day foreigner conspiracy cults, and mendicant bias. It sounds too good to be true, trust me, it's not. It was centered around subtly and cryptically revealing the foreigner flood war and all of its intricacies, and also that war's ties to the story of Halo 3, given that the flood were back in full force and were threatening the galaxy once again. It started out like most Bungie ARGs tend to start out. A cryptic AI takes over a forum account and starts responding to, for to forum users, but sadly, because Bungie got rid of all of the Halo sections of Bungie.net a few years ago, all of these forum posts have been lost, which is like, oh no. 
It's depressing. This AI started laying hints and directing users to strange IP addresses, searching for glyphs, which ultimately led to a MySpace page, yes, it's that old, for something called the Society of the Ancients, a human organization essentially trying to explain certain real-world oddities in our world, as in this world that I'm talking to you from, as creations of ancient aliens who inhabited Earth before us. Things like Stonehenge, Crop Circles, and the Antikythera mechanism of ancient Greece, which I've got to say, I, I absolutely love. I love it when fictional universes pull in real-world conspiracy theories and explain them using the context of their universe. It's something that I love so much about like the OG World at War through the Black Ops 2 zombie story, and it's one of the main reasons that I absolutely adore Iris. Shortly after their discovery, members of this cult showed up in Times Square holding placards with foreigner glyphs on them and handing out flyers. Stonehenge was not a myth, was not an accident! Back on the forums, Adjutant Reflex, which was the AI that was talking to people, had been defeated and taken over by a hostile AI. And as he was failing, he left the following comment. The stain on his hands will not wash. That damned spot as old as rock and time. What has he learned in Eon's slumber? I doubt it's mercy or sorrow. I am diminished, outranked. This new AI then revealed itself by a code name, Ghost713. That might sound a bit familiar, more on that in a minute. So Iris had five chapters and then one epilogue, which was a little bit different. The chapters at the end of each of them revealed a foreigner server, a video, and an audio file. This is how it all begins. Just in time to once again dance on the night of oblivion to relive what the aliens destroy and Chapter 2, titled Flood Control, began when classified job postings were found on MSN for a company called Flood Containment Control. This then led to the discovery of a phone number, which, when called, played a recording of two men who were likely from the CDC talking about the Center, or CDC, Center for Disease Control, going in to clean a site, and they've had some extremely unpredictable seasons lately, which likely refers to flood outbreaks and an increased number of flood outbreaks. Even the CDC involvement? The center usually goes in before we do, that's been my mm -hmm. By the time we have the site clean, they've moved on and we're pressing need. After all, we've had some extremely unpredictable seasons there. Chapter 3, called Echoes Through Time, was then revealed, which was a site with a locked foreigner device. However, when the recently released Halo 3 theme song ringtone sound file was played down a microphone on this website, it began to unlock the device, which revealed the next video, which detailed the foreigner's ancient struggle with the flood. Did we succeed? Did we fail? We did both, but depending on who you serve, after all, the Chapter 4, titled The Great Connection, was accessed after an equation was found buried in a hidden layer of an image in that third server. Some days later, a strange post popped up on Halo3.com containing a poem, which led people to a book called The Castaway Theory, the cover of which contained the equation that was found in the third server. This book, The Castaway Theory, detailed a theory that human DNA isn't actually from Earth. And yes, this book is real. This is all real. This exists. You can go out and buy that book right now. But a friend of the professor who wrote the book had left reviews on the Amazon page saying that the author, the professor, had gone missing. People later found the professor's hotmail, and after messaging him, he revealed the fourth server, which detailed not only the conservation measure, which the librarian did, but also the fact that humans and foreigners share some kind of biological connection, but that this connection would not be enough to save them from the flood. And chapter 5, the final chapter, called The Artifact, began when star maps that were available from each prior server were pieced together to spell the artifact location, which led to a GPS coordinate being revealed that pointed towards LA, Seattle, and New York. 
and once the timer on the coordinates page hit zero, the final server video was broadcast on the side of buildings in each respective city. And this video that was literally projected onto buildings in New York, Seattle and LA in the real world detailed the foreigners' mysteries of Earth, humanity and the arc portal that they buried on it. Before, and bear in mind this was done on the side of a building, right? In public, in the real world, it revealed that the AI that had taken over Adjutant Reflex and that had been revealing all of this information to us was 05032 Mendicant Bias. Dude, just try and picture that nowadays, right? Now that Mendicant Bias has the huge cult following that he does as a character, imagine you're in New York, right? You're just walking through a busy New York, just going off Times Square, and all of a sudden you see a video by Mendicant Bias talking about the Ark and the Flood projected on a building. Could you imagine just the level of absolute awe that you would feel nowadays if you saw that? Man, Iris was on another level. But it wasn't quite done yet. There was one more secret server that was yet to be found. The epilogue. This epilogue was once again from Mendicant Bias and it detailed the end of foreigner civilization and their firing of the halos. And before he leaves Adjutant Reflex's body, body, so to speak, considering he's an AI, and from that body enters the Ark's terminal network, connecting perfectly in with Halo 3's terminals, and in particular, its secret final terminal where Mendicant Bias finally speaks to Chief. And that's a very, very brief summary of Iris, which is something that, once again, you need to go and check out. Thankfully, CIA391 of Halopedia has done God's work and he's managed to back up and archive almost all of the foreigner server websites and all their connecting sites as well, so you can access them and go through them right now as if it were 2007. Thank you very much, Chris, for making sure that those haven't been lost to time. This kind of super cryptic and immersive storytelling is something that Halo is seriously lacking nowadays. Iris has you feeling like you're knee-deep in some in-universe clandestine conspiracy theory, discovering things that the government and the powers that be don't want you to discover. It really reminds me of the early days of the zombie story, and not just the information in that story, but the way that the story was told and discovered, and I really really wish Halo would get something like this again, whether it's an ARG or just a series of easter eggs in-game or something like that. This kind of storytelling, especially when it links to like the foreigners and the flood and that kind of stuff, just has a vibe unlike nothing else in Halo. So, what was your favourite piece of obscure and deep Halo lore? Is it something that I mentioned in this video? Is it something that I didn't mention? Also, did you learn something new from this video? I'd love to hear it down below in the comments. If I've gone so deep down the rabbit hole that you guys discover at least one new thing, then I'll be happy. I'll be very happy. If you enjoyed this video, like I said at the start, make sure you show some, some support down below because I want to start making content like this again. I just think it's a lot more rewarding and satisfying to make, so if you enjoy it and you want to see more for not just Halo but other games as well, then show your support down below. So with that said, I want to give a massive thank you to Caracal for becoming a new Primordial over on Patreon. Thank you very much, my friend. And of course, to everyone else for the continued support over there, as per usual. And with that said, I am going to dip because it's about 3 billion degrees in this country right now. It's awful in the UK. So hot. So hot. You know what? I'm going to go film another Flutter with Flavor video. Make sure you subscribe to that channel as well. So, thank you all very much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.